All right, great. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, webinar this afternoon. I'm, I'm very excited um, by the panel that we uh, have brought together to talk about regional innovation ecosystems. And in the most recent uh, NNI strategic plan, which I hope you've all carefully reviewed since its release on National Nanotechnology Day last fall, um, we have laid out uh, the vision for the NNI in the coming years. And, and in that, um, we've identified five goals. And the second goal is to promote uh, commercialization of nanotechnology. And one of the areas that we highlighted in our objectives was explicitly to look at the, uh, to engage with and enhance connections among regional innovation ecosystems to support nanotechnology commercialization in every part of the country. And, and that's what this webinar is all about today. I, I'm so pleased to be joined um, by three members of innovation ecosystems. Um, we have someone representing uh, a university and a user facility um, that's so important to nanotechnology R&D. Uh, we have someone who's representing kind of the, the, the finance and the, uh, the advisory role perspective um, that's so important to, to give small companies um, advice and guidance and, and support. And, and we also have an entrepreneur with us today to, to share the perspective of actually building a company and, and doing nanotechnology and, and transitioning into commercialization. So I'm really excited um, to, to have this discussion today. And, and the way that we have it planned is um, we will have three presentations and then we're gonna open it up to Q&A. So we're gonna start, I'm gonna give brief introductions of our three panelists and, and then we'll go ahead and move into the presentations. Our first speaker today um, is Dr. Tony Green and he is the Chief Scientific Officer of Ben Franklin Technology Partners of Southeastern PA. Ben Franklin invests in early stage technology-based firms and established manufacturers and provides access to business and technical expertise and a network of expert resources and mentoring. Dr. Green has directed numerous public-private partnerships focused on emerging technologies, including the nationally recognized Nanotechnology Institute, a consortium of 13 regional research institutions and corporations led by Ben Franklin, UPenn, and Drexel. And I have known Tony for many, many years, and I'm really excited to have um, his participation today. Our second speaker will be Dr. Gerald Lopez. He's the Director of Operations and Business Development at the Singh Center for Nanotechnology. The Singh Center is a next generation nanotechnology center that merges traditional approaches to nanoscale development with unique state-of-the-art equipment, materials, and ideas. The Mid-Atlantic Nanotechnology Hub, located at the Singh Center, is one of the 16 sites of the National Nanotechnology Coordinated Infrastructure, which is sponsored by the National Science Foundation. And you hear us here at the NNCO talk an awful lot about the NNCI, the, the user facilities located across the country, along with the Nanoscale Science Research Centers supported by DOE. Um, and our final panelist is Dr. Brendan DeLacy. He's the president and founder of Bollydell Technologies, an R&D firm focused on the development of innovative materials and manufacturing technologies. Um, areas of research include nanocomposite design and synthesis, coatings and thin films, hypersonic materials and manufacturing and pharmaceutical tagging and authentication. So um, I'm really excited to, to hear the presentations from our panelists. And again, stay, stay tuned for the, the Q&A uh, following the presentation. So with that, we're gonna turn it over to Tony. Thank you. The world of Zoom, so stay with me. All right, so um, can you see my screen? All right, so let's do this. See if we can get this on presentation mode. There we go. So, first of all, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about uh, regional innovation and uh, focus not just on 
how these things happen, but why they're important and how, in this case, the role of nanotechnology plays an important role in feeding these regional innovation ecosystems. So I'm gonna start first with sort of some basics about Ben Franklin for those that don't know us, but I wanna frame the discussion with a quote, and this to me frames everything. Science has cured every disease known to mice. We all know what researchers can do. We know what they can do in a lab, but until you actually have a product that's out there working, you don't have a product. And all of the attributes that go into getting something out the door is what, quite frankly, all three of us on the panel today and what the purpose of goal two uh, in the new NNI strategic plan is designed to do. It's important for basic research, absolutely. But if we're going to use this technology to improve quality of life, to provide new resources, new products, new technologies, you have to underpin it with this basic science, but you also need an ecosystem that can take that and translate that into something that you can hold in your hand or inject. So I like this quote, from my friend Dave Weiner here at Penn. So let me talk a little bit about Ben Franklin. We are a statewide organization of sorts. We are independent 501c3 nonprofits. We are a nonprofit venture capital. That's oxymoron number one. We get our core funding from the state of Pennsylvania, but it is not the only source of our funding. In fact, the state money is only about a third of our budget. We have an obligation, the four Ben Franklins, which were created almost 40 years ago, to be economic growth catalysts. And we do it by investing in technology. That's our mission, is to increase economic prosperity, economic growth, job creation through investment in technology companies. We are in the Southeast of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and the four surrounding counties, obviously dominated by the major universities that are here. There's about $2 billion in R&D funding in Southeast Pennsylvania alone. So as I said, we've been around almost 40 years. We've invested two, over $200 million into 2,000 companies. We are the most active seed investor of technology companies on the East Coast and usually in the top five or top 10 in the country in terms of the number of deals that we do. We do more deals than Kleiner Perkins. We have fewer zeros after our investments. We will do the first $10,000, $25,000 to, can I even build my widget? Or forget whether your magic drug cures diabetes, does it kill the mice? These basic de-risking questions that have to happen. So we go all the way down and then we invest no different than a for-profit venture capital, but do it in a nonprofit environment so that the returns on our investments, and we're actually very good at what we do, goes right back into new companies. So just to give you, we just uh, released this for last year. We put 8.4 million into 39 companies. What you can also see here is that we're technology agnostic. So we have three major sectors. We have IT, healthcare, physical sciences, that's our manufacturing, drones and so forth, all, all fit into that. Our budget will change anywhere from 6 million to 12 million each year. Our most active year, we put 12 million on the street into 62 companies, that was six years ago. And again, fulfilling our mission, which is to help grow the state. Right now we have 205 active portfolio companies. Last year, they we, over a half a billion dollars in follow-on funding and created or retained almost 4,000 jobs. The other piece that's important to our mission is that as with many organizations, we are very much focused on not just the social impact of what we do, are the companies that we're investing in having an impact in the community, but also we're uh, also working hard to expand the opportunities for minority and women-led enterprises. And these numbers of 36 and 38% are actually much higher than the national average, but they're not where anybody wants to be. 
And so we've, we, we actually have a goal um, to try and achieve those kinds of expanded numbers to really improve that number. How do we do this? We call it council, council, and connections, capital, council, and connections. So we will put in up to a million dollars over the lifetime of a company. And we will start with, as I said, we will put in 10 or 25,000 to work with the Sing Nano Center, for instance, to help with a prototype. Our first real investment starts at 50,000 with a match from the company. And this is another important piece that's required, we think, so companies need to have skin in the game. So if you have a $50,000 uh, investment with a $50,000 match, which could be an SBIR or angel funding, or the joke is friends, family, fools, and Franklin, um, you've got, 100, you've got an, a, a phase one SBIR. And it not only gives you line of sight on whether your technology can really be manufactured. You have to remember one of the goals of everything that we do is you can have a graduate student make three widgets, one of which one works, one doesn't, one sort of works. How do you now make a thousand? How do you make a million? And then when you challenge them and say, okay, I'm going to ask you to make you a million of these widgets, three of which don't work. How do you know which ones don't work? That is not the purview of academia. That's the purview of companies. And so part of this money is designed to help get to that point up to a mil up to, uh, up to a million dollars and now we have a for-profit fund that I won't talk about but if the companies don't have good management teams or good connections they're never going to succeed and so a lot of these early stage funding opportunities are also there to help evaluate the management team and when you go into the venture community they're investing as much in the management team as in the technology, some cases even more so. So we wanna have a line of sight to the management teams, but if we don't help them, then the company isn't going anywhere and we don't get paid back. And that's a problem for us because our job is to keep putting money on the street. And the other piece that we do, of course, is we have extensive networks of partners and I'll talk about that in a minute. But how do we invest? As I said, we have Three, sec three basic sectors, we split health and digital health a couple of years ago because the dynamics are very different. It's you know, a digital health company with putting an app on a phone or on a smartwatch is very different than a biotech. And you need a very different group of people doing the due diligence. And the economics are very different. You can, you know, do, a digital health company can be done with not as much money. A biotech, a biopharmaceutical company, you're talking you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. The other thing that we do that's rather unique, um, and this is something that, that, the, that having that credibility in a regional ecosystem allows you to do, is that we also get money from other sources to invest on their behalf. So we have $6 million from Independence Blue Cross, or three million from Independence, matched by $3 million for us to invest in digital health. We have $4 million from Bucks County Pension Fund to invest in companies that live in Bucks County outside of Philadelphia. We have one of the most successful university partnerships with Temple University with a $2 million, where Temple entrusts us with a million dollars of their money to invest on their behalf in Temple spinouts. These are all fairly groundbreaking initiatives that we've done. So this brings us access to a lot more capital because capital is king here. So what do we look for? In this case, they must be a for-profit business. We don't fund nonprofits. Because we take state money, the state gets a little persnickety about investing in companies outside of the state. And in this case, we cover the five counties of southeastern Pennsylvania. As I mentioned, there are three other Ben Franklins around the state. We really want to see a technological differentiation. This is really important. We are not doing consumer goods. We want something that's different. We, and, we, and we want to know that what we're investing in is not just differentiated, but advances a commercialization opportunity. 
In many cases, it's built around IP, and we will do active due diligence for that IP. But in some cases, it could be know-how and proprietary information, or there could be no technological differentiation, and it's marketing muscle only. And we actually are not doing those kinds of investments, where the only differentiation is how fast and how much marketing can you do to get their product out. And as I mentioned, you have to have skin in the game. Every dollar that Ben Franklin invests has to be matched by at least a dollar from the company. And for the most part, this needs to be professional money. For our earliest stage companies, we will accept SBIR grants. But once you get above 100,000, we want angel or true venture dollars in there. Um, we have to know that there's a true outside commercialization uh, view of this company. Our process is difficult and it's difficult for a reason. It takes about 90 days, but we will do an extensive application that includes, let's look at the IP, let's look at the cap table, let's look at the marketing plan. Is it really the right place to go? We spend a lot of time working with companies that think they have a great technology that's useful for a, a product line over here when really it should be over here. There's an internal evaluation and every investment that we do gets approved by our board of directors. Again, this was set up 40 years ago by the state. And so we make sure that there's transparency in everything we're doing because we are doing taking public dollars. But as I mentioned, if we don't follow up that investment with other support programs, these companies are guaranteed to fail. And so we work with corporations, with business connections, with our universities, to sing as a resource for our companies, other entrepreneurs, legislators, and other investors. That's part of our job is to make these kinds of connections, which we call our circle of benefit. One of our newest programs, and this is not our program specifically that we brought down from MIT, the MIT Venture Met, is a mentoring program. And it is a terrific program about building the next generation of entrepreneurs. This is not a boot camp. This is not an accelerator. This is team mentoring of entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. And we do this in conjunction with another regional organization called PACT. It's, we're now starting our seventh year, and these numbers are actually outdated. We have 115 mentors and 180 mentees, and we're up over 3,500 volunteer hours and mentoring sessions. It's an extraordinarily valuable program about building the capacity of a inexperienced CEO to lead his or her current company, or more often than not, their next company. I've mentioned this a couple of times. We have a virtual accelerator. We don't have, Ben Franklin does not have its own accelerator. We partner, but we have a virtual accelerator and we do it in two ways. One is our FabNet program. The other is Prima, which is supported by a federal grant from the US EDA, where we provide small matching grants to get access to a network of over 40 service providers from market research to prototyping, animal studies, clinical resources, manufacturing, supply chain, you name it, we've got it. Again, a very successful program. The Singh Nano Center is very much a part of both of these groups, the FabNet and Prima. And our job is to bring opportunities to Sing to say what they have there, and Gerald can talk about this more specifically, that the resources they have can help a small company solve a very specific problem. Again, very successful program, but it's really designed to do that basic de-risking. This is just some examples, but I do wanna point out uh, a VC, really interesting technology developed at the University of Pennsylvania, and it has developed a new nano-enabled drainage device for treating glaucoma. Most glaucoma patients, they put in these big shunts and they wind up 50% of the time, they wind up coming back for more surgery. This is a technology and it was prototyped and developed 
again at the Singh Nano Center that is now in clinical trials. And they started with a $4,000 FabNet grant, got a $10,000 Prima grant, got a $300,000 investment from Ben Franklin. We've now upped that investment. They got a big phase two SBIR and they're doing a new funding round, which allow, is allowing them to get into the clinic. But this technology could never even get to this point without, in this case, the resources of the Singh Nano Center. We also work, as I said, we don't have our own accelerator, but we've got a lot of them in the region. This is just a quick list. And of course, we work with our university partners around the region. Part of our job and part of my job at Ben Franklin is to sit at the universities to see what's next, what's coming down the pipe, what are the technologies that are coming out five years from now or 10 years from now, most of which may never see the light of day. But we work with them all and they all have translational research programs and we see our teams at Ben Franklin set on all these committees. So I wanna bring this back, sort of closing a little bit to where we are and how this relates to the NNI strategic plan. And you can see here, and again, as Lisa pointed out, everybody should have had copies and read uh, the plan from cover to cover. Goal two, promote commercialization. And these are the five components of that. And what I'd like to state is that a good regional ecosystem includes all of these and then some. And so this is how we approach developing a regional innovation ecosystem. I call this our basic equipment list. It's not just the technology generation. It's not just the capital to make it happen, but you need corporates, you need government. You also need the policy people because if the policy people and the federal government or the state governments or the city governments don't allow you to do it, it ain't happening. Specialized resources, this is this FabNet and Prima program. How do you get your product manufactured? You need tinkering space. A lot of places have resources and accelerators, but not every place does. And the last piece and becoming critically important is management and talent. Who's gonna run these companies? Who's gonna take these technologies forward and get them out to the market? And how do you develop an educated, competent, diverse workforce to make these happen. The new technologies that are coming out of the research institutions are highly technical and need highly technical capabilities in the talent and you can't get them right now. Real shortage, just try finding a good software engineer these days for not a lot of money, can't find them. Uh, so you need all seven of these when you start to think about a regional ecosystem. If you don't, it isn't going to happen. So when I, when I was asked to, to talk today, um, I pulled out some old slides. So this is a workshop from the NNI that I did. Uh, Tom Khalil was still there. Uh, so this is almost exactly nine years ago uh, in June of 2013. And what's interesting is if you look at the slides that I showed, which is what are the potential solutions provided by nanotech, you can look through this list. And while some of them have moved on, a lot of them still are around. We're still talking about telecommun telecommunications and electronics. We're still talking about environment. Life sciences and medicine, that's moved obviously quite substantially the uh, coronavirus, the COVID vaccines, many of them are nanoparticle enabled uh, uh, solutions. Uh, the new efforts on energy storage and generation batteries with the president's initiative to have an EV station every 50 miles and the new uh, uh, recommendations for EVs in general. We need all sorts of new technologies and we're not there yet but nano in this case is a means to an end. What's also true nine years later is that many of these issues are still here. The cost of the equipment to make these things is still very high. You still have quality control issues on the nanomaterials. 
the lack of capability or experience in manufacturing, early stage private investment that's just, that's independent of technology that's always going to be there. There's still some regulatory uncertainties. The analytical tools that are needed to evaluate, did you actually make what you think you made? And at nano it becomes even more of a difficult issue and the lack of a trained workforce. And there's still a lack of understanding of nano's potential. And it surprises me to some degree, but it doesn't for all the wrong reasons, that people still don't quite get that nano has some important contributions to make to the advancement of technology. It's not gonna kill us. It's not gonna cause the world to collapse as they said it was going to do 10 years ago. But there's still a lot of skepticism out there about technology in general. And it's the, if there is a ask of the people on this webinar, it's to make sure that it's our responsibility to get that message out there that what we're doing is important, that it has implications, and then it's done in an ethical and scientific way. So in the end, uh, this is another quote from a friend of mine in the, in the pharmaceutical space. This is where I think we are. He doesn't care if it's nano, micro, yakto, grouch, or zeppo. If it gets his product out the door 10 minutes faster, I'm interested. Nano is an important means to an end. It has its own end in of itself, but if it helps get products out the door, then that's where we need to be. And the, one of the mechanisms that we did this, Lisa mentioned our Nanotechnology Institute. This is the first multi-institutional university industry regional partnership, 13 institutions that signed a single legal agreement. It lasted for about 13 years and then moved on because it served its purpose. It got the communities talking together. It got the faculty talking together. It got collaborations going together. So the point being is that there are models out there that can be used and they're very successful. And I will stop there. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tony. That was a, a great start to our All discussion right. this afternoon. Uh, I think that- There we go. Great, great. And next, we're gonna we're gonna move on to Gerald and get the perspective from uh, a university and a user facility. So, Gerald, do you want to share your screen? Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, Lisa, thanks again for the invitation here to, to speak today. Uh, really honored to be here and. Uh, you know, as Tony had mentioned, uh, there was a lot of consideration when building this center, uh, the Singh Center for Nanotechnology. Um, and I would say, you know, a lot of strides have been made in a very short time. We're kind of, we're still kind of the new kid on the block, uh, if you think about the age of our center. But I'm going to talk a little bit about focusing on, you know, what are we doing in our engagement? What are we doing in our efforts uh, in promoting uh, innovation here at the Singh Center? Um, so, <clears throat> as you can see, this is a building of the Singh Center. This is it's, 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 it's a hallmark. Is this cantilever structure that juts out right over the screen space? Um, and you know, it's it's a fantastic building. I think one of the visions behind this building was when you walk into this building, you need to see the research happen. When you do walk into this building, and Lisa and and Tony has been there, you walk right into this transparent glass wall, orange wall. Uh, that looks right into the clean room. Um, and that was the vision behind uh, the former uh, Dean Eduardo Glenn. Um, the second piece to this building was of course, just to make it a venue, right? You can't just have lab space. You need a place to commune. You need a place to bring people together and talk science, talk shop, right? Uh, and extend beyond the walls that are just within the lab space. And I think that's why this, this cantilever that you see is actually an auditorium. Um, and there are also several other nooks and crannies in this building, believe it or not, um, that where people can, again, meet and talk uh, about what they're doing. So <clears throat> just to move forward here, let's talk a little bit about Philadelphia. Let's talk about the university real quick so that everyone gets an idea of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so this is actually looking east towards the city from University City. And actually, if you look in the corner there on the left, left hand side, you can see the Singh Center and the little um, cantilever sticking out. 
But when we talk about Philadelphia, we, we need to talk about, well, its size, right? It's a large economic region. It's a population of 6.1 million people, right? The second largest city on the East Coast, sixth largest in the U.S. And a lot of regional economic drivers, right? You look at 100 colleges and universities within an hour, five medical schools, large biopharma presence, heavy industry, 300 plus healthcare facilities, chemicals, refineries. I mean, there's just a lot of things going on here. When you talk about the university itself, um, you know, it was founded in 1740, right? This, this combination of, of, of a medical school and all these other schools coming together. Uh, and our founder, of course, is, is Ben Franklin, for those that don't know. And we are the largest employer in Philadelphia, for those that don't aren't aware. Um, and as employees, we actually outnumber the number of students that we have. Uh, when you look at our, our, our ratios between graduate students who are doing the research versus the undergrads who are attending and working under degrees, uh, we're about 50-50, right? Uh, so very heavy tier one, right, uh, type of research institution. Over a billion uh, dollars in spo annually sponsored research, obviously located in this dense urban environment, which makes us very highly accessible. Um, an operating budget of 13.45 billion, that includes the, the medical school here, uh, with an endowment of 20, uh, 20 billion, where about 800 million goes to tuition, back to, to instruction and operations, right? Um, and donations annually from our from from, from our, our wonderful donors is about 100 million a year. Um, but if you look at the regional economic impact of this campus alone, right, it's 21, almost 22 billion dollars. Uh, and that's that's just uh, you know that that uh, that's that's there's a sign that it tells you that there's it, this is a driver. This is an institution that, that is um, you know built and knows how to manage these enterprises. And so we're going to focus down a little bit more on on the Singh Center and how we fit into all of this. So the Singh Center for Nanotechnology, uh, we actually have this vision to educate, influence, and catalyze nanotechnology, right? And our mission is to drive cutting edge scholarship, productive collaboration, and a positive culture in nano. And, and Tony may find this very familiar because he was part of this conversation uh, when we were forming this, this our, our vision and mission statement, right? Uh, he's part of our executive uh, external advisory board. So around the Singh Center, right, we're, we're, we have this compass of scholarship, right, uh, culture and impact and collaboration that's, that's kind of pointing us in the right direction, uh, resting on our four, three priorities of education, research and innovation and engagement. And so we're always looking in this direction and allowing this, allowing this to guide us as we're moving forward. And as Lisa had mentioned, um, you know, we are also part of the National Now Technology Coordinated Infrastructure, right? So our, our vision and mission is congruent to what this is, what we're serving as a portion of the 16 member uh, 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 infrastructure, where we're just a nationally recognized center of, center of excellence. Uh, and each represents our own region, le region and leadership and kind of guiding as we're moving along. So what does that mean for us? We're known as the Mid-Atlantic Nanotechnology Hub, right? Um, and so let me show you what this means. Uh, for those that don't know, Philadelphia is bookend between Washington, D.C. and New York City. Uh, and believe it or not, uh, you know, we have about five government labs and 16 universities, all of which are somehow nano enabled. Right. And with these small nano fabs, large nano fabs, this is it, uh, this is the largest or highest density of academic nano fabs in the world. Right. If you think about it. You have, they're all accessible with via airports or rail, 75% you can access on through I-95 alone. Um, our furthest neighbors, right, are east and along island uh, to, uh, at Brookhaven to Pitt or CMU, right? And then our closest neighbors is just like one city block, right? Drexel really sits right behind us here on this block where we're sitting in the Singh Center. Um, and, 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 and so as, as, you know, sitting here as a Mid-Atlantic Technology Hub or MANF, um, you know, when we started out, we started saying, well, let's coordinate, let's talk to each other in this region. And we actually have, um, before the pandemic hit us really hard, uh, we had every six months we would meet um, with, with the operations managers just to kind of understand how we're working together, uh, if there's anything new that we should be uh, be looking at and even talking to each other about, hey, we're, getting, we're, we're looking at new equipment or procurement and things of that nature. But looking at the Singh Center itself, what's, what's in the Singh Center uh, as this nanotech resource? Well, we actually are composed of three core facilities that I help uh, with the operations. 
We have the Quattro Nanofabrication Facility. This is our 11,000 square foot clean room that you walk and see. Um, we have the Nanoscale Characterization Facility, which houses our electron mic microscopes. And then we have the Scanning and Local Probe Facility, which actually manages all of our um, scanning probes like atomic microscopy uh, or, 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 or other um, probe tip uh, metrologies. And then we have uh, this piece where, of course, we're part of the MNCI. So with that, we received $10 million in our grant to help push professional development, to create programs in that, to help push uh, educational programs, to bring in people uh, that want to learn and, and do internships right, uh, with us. And of course, uh, talk about innovation and engaging for innovation and entrepreneurship. So altogether, we have 94 tools that are interlocked, 13 in the, in the what we call the NCF, the Nanoscale Characterization Facility, 72 in the clean room, and nine in the scanning local probe facility. So when you look at us at the, as this resource, you look at this not only for our tool sets, look at this for our expert staff, expert staff uh, and for advisement and guidance to get you going, right? And one of the things when it comes to our engagement, especially for those coming in from the outside, uh, when we set up our agreements, uh, we're non-predatory when it comes to your IP. We want you to come in and we, or if, as much as we can, we can get you started, but then we're hands off. We want you to own what you're doing. Right? We want you to really develop uh, your work. And of course, none of this would, would, could, could be possible without all my wonderful, talented colleagues that we see here. So let's talk more about our composition. Let's talk more about our numbers and how we're doing in our research activity. And I think people are always interested, in, well, what is it that you do and what are your main competencies? Uh, so let's talk about our users. You know, we're about 60, 40 internal, external users. So internal users, you're looking at faculty, right? Faculty users, uh, graduate students, postdocs, that sort of thing. External users, we're going to show you that in a second. So when you talk about our utilization, these hours that we've that that people have put in, what are they working on? We can see a large portion of this is supporting material science research, right? 32%. Then you start looking at Life science and medicine at 17%, quantum physics and optics, and then MEMS and mechanical engineering, right about 17 to 20%. And the rest is you know, this other 13%, right? So we know that's our supporting competencies that we have here. We look to the outside, who's coming in, right? Over 50% of them are these external academic uh, universities, right? Uh, and institutions that are, that are using and are leveraging our resources, right? To drive their innovation and their research. Right? But then you have this other, uh, what you see here, almost 33% of 30% of large companies and small companies coming in and developing and doing their work too, right? If you look at the time that we've been open since 2015, uh, and you look at the number of work years, right? Um, we've been able in eight years, over 200 work years of research. Uh, I mean, this is extraordinary. And what happened after the pandemic is that there's a lot of backlog work and just, things just shot up really far, uh, almost exponentially uh, when, when we got, when we reopened our doors. But let's focus in on some of the things that people started growing into, right? When we opened our doors. If you look at large and small companies, there is this increase in, uh, you know, interest in life science and medicine, right? The number of hours that have been contributed. Look at materials, there's obviously an interest in materials by large companies. And then when you look at external academics, they really wanted to leverage our, our resources for quantum physics and optics, and obviously MEMS and mechanical engineering. Um, and so we, we realized that like our own internal strengths were also helping these external individuals uh, that were coming in uh, to help them with their work. So let's talk about internal. What do we do internally? How does this thing center work? Um, and, and work with the rest of this research enterprise at Penn. Uh, well, when you talk about the Penn, when you talk about Penn, you're talking about 12 schools uh, and we're trying to understand our value, right? So touching Penn's research enterprise, we're the first multidisciplinary center on campus uh, where you really don't have to have this traditional background of working in semiconductors to come and work in our space. And I think that's, that's a really neat thing to, uh, to understand, but to actually show it is another thing. And we were able to do that. So if you look at the Singh Center, we actually touched six of the 12 schools across Penn's campus. And if you trace funding and collaboration, 
you can see how the schools actually interact between the departments. And I think this is really neat to see because you can see the directionality where, say, if you start with a vet school at the bottom, how it goes through the School of Engineering back to us. Or if you go from the School of Engineering, it points all the way to dental, and then it goes back to us, or vice versa, really. Um, and so this is something that we really wanted to understand. We, we did, our, did our homework, um, and it does tell us that, yes, we are standing here on a multidisciplinary center, and we need to stay here to, to help pursue and push the research that's going on. But what do we do externally? And I think this is where why we're meeting today, right? How do we foster these engagements? Well, one of the things that we started when we uh, became part of the NNCI was this thing called the Innovation C Grant. Um, and our Innovation C Grant, the current cohort, it's at, it was actually open to both startups and academic institutions. Uh, and so we, we changed a little bit on our guidance depending on what our feedback is from our, our review panel every year. This year we opened up to several academic institutions to come in and a few startups. And preference is obviously given to first time engagement, right? So they have to submit an application uh, and they can be awarded up to $4,000 in tool and, and, and lab and tool access. Um, so what does that mean? That means they're not gonna be charged, we actually don't charge them um, the actual corporate rate, we'll charge them the academic rate. So they actually get a lot more high uh, runway for this $4,000, up to $4,000. Um, and the second piece is, is obviously they can go up for renewal for the following year, right? If their work is substantiated. Um, and so I think, you know, this fits into like one of the main things that I, I believe other institutions would like to do. It's like, you know, they want to help reduce rates, right, and provide a way to like get people to engage. This is non-dilutive funding. We're not asking anything of, of anyone that apply and are working through with us. And so this helps kind of bolster them into this position to work. Now, what happens when they're done? When they're done, um, we have this option of joining what's called Club Nano Edge. Um, and Club Nano Edge is just access to our clean room. It's, it doesn't provide access uh, to, say, the metrology equipment downstairs, right? That's a re those are recharge facilities downstairs. The, the clean room is treated differently. I'll tell you why. When you're building a widget, and you're building a widget, maybe the first of its kind, you really don't know if it's going to work, right? Um, and so what we did is we found a way to create this budget-friendly uh, rate structure that allows, you know, uh, uh, these startups to come in and work on their projects. Uh, and it reduced the risk of cost uh, and ownership for the research and development overall. And I can go into greater details on how, how we approach this. But I think what's really important is to talk about the outcomes of all this, right? When you look at what's happened and since we've been open, Singh affiliated startups have received $60 million in grants and revenue so far. Uh, and last year was a blockbuster year for one of our companies that won 20 million in Series B. Um, but you know, this is kind of what we're keeping track of when we're moving through this ecosystem since we started, right? And this has been a very short term that we've been here. Um, but I think what's important is that you know, a lot of, of, of universities and institutions that are thinking about having a center like ours, you know, they're thinking about how do we engage these small companies? How do we bring them in? And the first two things they're going to think about is, well, uh, we should provide a reduced rate for the SBIR companies or some startups, maybe write letters of support, but that doesn't solve the other pain points that startups have. And I think Brendan can, can talk more about this. And so how do you quantify the nebulous tasks of lab and tool use in this new, new technology, right? How do you, how, if we were to, you know, argue with that uh, for funding for a program manager? Or how do you manage expectations of funding agencies or funding stakeholders to de-risk this investment you're asking to do? And I think the third piece is, how do you encourage the continued engagement after funding, right? And, and I think what you see here is this progression of providing non-dilutive funding at, at the beginning, a small amount to kind of get them going, right, with the Innovation C grant. And when they're done, transitioning it into something that's realistic, uh, that meets these three pain points that I had mentioned um, so that they're clear as to what the expectations are. The program managers are clear what the expectations are. So lastly, you know, as a summary, you know, we're a recognized center of excellence. We're part of the NNCI. We're strategically, strategically positioned in this urban environment uh, comprised of three core facilities, have enabled so many years of work, work years of research. 
Uh, and you know, aside from our programs of innovation, we have professional development. Um, we have actually a cooperation with the uh, Community College of Philadelphia uh, for nanotechnicians program. And we have a lot of educational outreach. Uh, with that, I like, I, I'm, I'm open to any questions. Great, thank you so much. And I, I have a, a long list of questions that I'm gonna save uh, for the, the Q&A period after uh, our final presentation, but there's just one I wanna ask now before we move on. And when you talked about the seed fund, uh, I, I know we've talked to a number of companies and we've um, done podcasts and other engagement with folks who have um, uh, been fortunate enough to, to receive seed funding from you and, and you know they've shared the impact that that's had on their small business. Um, Tony mentioned that that their region covers uh, five different counties in in southeastern Pennsylvania. Is there uh, a regional restriction to um, the the eligibility for your seed fund? You know, there there we haven't really put a restriction on region just because of the fact that if there is somebody that's in Virginia or West Virginia, we wanna be open to them if they wanna come over, right? Um, I, I, think, I think doing, I think uh, siloing ourselves into a specific region uh, actually does a disservice to these, these ecosystems that are, are disenfranchised just because of geography. Um, now, obviously if someone were to come in from say, you know, the West Coast and we're trying to bring them over, uh, that's another, Thing to talk about, right? There's the funny situation is way different over there. Why are you coming to us? There's a lot of resources over there. So it's it's definitely something where we don't want to be too restrictive, uh, but it, but yes, we do to put it into consideration. Okay, great. And we'll come back to that point at the Q&A because I think that, you know, one of the issues is, you know, in that case, maybe you could send them to one of the NNCI centers that, that are out West. But, but um, exactly. I'd like to move on to our our final uh, presenter today, and, and that question was also a little bit for Brendan um, because of the, the eligibility um, coming from Delaware in, in um, being not, not situated directly in Philadelphia. Um, but I'm really looking forward to kind of the, the third leg of our stool today um, to get the perspective from an entrepreneur. So with that, I'm gonna, let you go ahead. Thanks, Brendan. I appreciate it, Alicia. Uh, thanks for allowing me to have a chat today and to provide this perspective. Um, just a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I, I too come from the government uh, lay of the land. I'm a former government scientist with the US Army at Aberdeen Proving Ground uh, in Maryland. And prior to that, I also worked in industry with Merck Pharmaceuticals. So. I kind of come at this from a, a wide vantage point. Uh, Bally Doe is based in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, there's an ecosystem within uh, the, the, called the Delaware Innovation Space, which is housed specifically at DuPont's uh, experimental station within Wilmington. So two of the buildings on that campus have been designated towards uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem for, for tech startups. So there's a picture of our building and our lab space, et cetera. So that's where we're at, just down the road from Philadelphia. And the company was founded in 2018, but I really didn't get this thing going until 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. You know, I had this entrepreneurial bug for quite a while and I've got two young kids and uh, middle of a pandemic, perfect time to start a company, right? Uh, the, when is a perfect time? You, you just either wanna do it or you don't. So. Uh, 2020 is when we really uh, got this thing going and I, and I jumped ship, so to speak. Uh, our goal is to develop novel materials and technologies that can be integrated into existing products or existing manufacturing platforms, thereby enhancing uh, commercialization potential. Uh, we're pretty small at this juncture, five employees, myself, uh, Sid Garrett, uh, PhD in electrical engineering, and we've got a variety of other folks and, and, and skill sets that complement one another within the company. Uh, material synthesis, computational electromagnetics, a lot of interaction of light with matter is what we deal with. Uh, I'll get into um, an anti-counterfeit story with um, for, for, for drugs, for pharmaceuticals. So we've got, we have some FDA regulatory expertise uh, in-house as well. 
I've had ex extensive uh, academic cap collaborations through the years, including now with Ballydale. Uh, we collaborate with the University of Delaware, Drexel University, uh, MIT in the past, Temple, Rice, Ohio University, Utah State are some of those folks that we've uh, collaborated with in the past. Uh, here's just a nice little image of, uh, you know, we all love pictures, right? Here's just some areas that we're working on. Uh, hypersonic materials and manufacturing uh, to the left there. You know, what's this about? These are high temperature materials that can withstand, uh, you know, going out into space, re-entry, dealing with the hot and cold temperatures that are encountered in space. Uh, top center there is a, a focal point of the business. The tagging and tracking of vaccine and biologic files that are utilized in, in for biologics and vaccines throughout supply chain. Uh, I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, upper right hand corner, uh, scalable max phase and vaccine synthesis and application space. This is a unique material that was discovered uh, by folks at Drexel University. Talk about that. And then in general, our business is focused on developing novel nanoparticles, nanostructures, and nanocomposites that can be employed in a variety of applications. So I'll just go through a variety of case studies here. Our, our, our main revenue source is the SBIR and STTR funding source. My goal is not to have Valley Dell as a quote unquote SBIR company. I don't want that to happen. I want to employ the SBIR and STTR process to develop technologies and products and to commercialize those. It's just merely an avenue to develop uh, technologies and products. Um, we don't need to read this, but we've concluded uh, two phase one SBIRs thus far in about a year and a half, um, uh, one with NASA, one with the Air Force. Currently, we've, we've got uh, one SBIR going with the National Science Foundation on the tagging technology, and we've just initiated a ChemBio sensor uh, project uh, as well. And we've got a couple pending. So I'll go into each of these just to give the audience a flavor of what we do and uh, what our goals are with each of these tasks. So the first one that I, that I feel is, is uh, most promising, this is the one that will be our first product is an anti-counterfeit solution for, for the pharmaceutical industry. And we had uh, great timing for this. We, we submitted our proposal to the National Science Foundation just prior to the pandemic occurring. And, uh, you know, timing is everything, right? So it, it was a good, it was a good topic for supply chain integrity and authentication. Uh, just to let the audience know, uh, the counterfeiting of drugs is a huge worldwide problem. We're not talking about some guy down in his basement making fake drugs and selling them. We're talking about mass distribution and mass copying of drugs, intellectual property being stolen and, and mass production of those drugs uh, being sold. Um, and the results in, in some uh, scenarios of this problem is the following. First, there's toxicity issues with fake drugs, the ones that are not real. They greatly impact the patient. Number two, there's a huge revenue loss that is incurred by these pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical companies. And finally, three, brand integrity. You just can't put a value on the negative publicity and negative feel, so to speak, associated with problems uh, that are caused by these counterfeits. So our goal is to mitigate this problem. Now, the, the industry, the pharmaceutical industry as a whole, uh, employs a variety of approaches to mitigate the counterfeit technologies. They, they use, you know, labeling and, and very unique labels that can try to uh, tag, track, and authenticate their products. Problem with many of these is that the labels themselves are easily counterfeited. There's expert labeling folks around the world. The image there on the left here is th those are three fake labels that are expertly made. Uh, in the center, you can certainly employ QR codes to tag and track your product, but QR codes themselves are ubiquitous in society now, right? So these are very easily counterfeited. There's other uh, approaches that have their pluses and minuses, but really the industry is really seeking a, a solid covert and counterfeit proof tagging technology. And, and that's the space that we're trying to fill. Again, the impact of the counterfeit problem is on consumer health. Uh, in terms of uh, revenue loss, there's the, the global counterfeit drug market in 2020 was estimated to be greater than $200 billion. 
And then again, on the right there, you can't really put a, a dollar value on negative press that's caused by these counterfeits. So our solution is a quote unquote invisible tag. It's not truly invisible, but it doesn't mean anything when you look at it. Uh, and we, we're gonna uh, create very unique holographic images that are generated uh, by our tags. And, and these uh, tags will serve to mitigate damage to brand integrity and increase revenue, not just for the pharmaceutical companies, but we wanna increase revenue and provide value to the vial manufacturers and the labeling manufacturers that are employed by the industry. So basically, this is a very uh, sparse overview of our technology. Our labels are placed on a vial, so to speak. You interrogate with a certain type of light. And we have a holographic image that's produced. It can be a word. It could be a number. It could be a logo. In this case, we're projecting a QR code, of course, into which we could embed a series of product information. And then you can employ a simple phone application to read that QR code that is projected. So we've got great flexibility in our technology. Um, here's a little example on the left. Each of those little squares on the, on the, on the glass panel at the left represent um, a quote unquote master, a, a design tag. And those tags are transferred over into the center into a roll to roll plastic uh, process. Uh, so it's certainly scalable. And when you interrogate one of these little squares, you, you project a particular image. In this case, we're projecting the word valid or a QR code, but we've got great flexibility. And, uh, you know, I'm not getting into the proprietary aspects of this technology, but it is uh, very counterfeit proof and we can encrypt it in all sorts of way uh, where it's a true lock and key type of uh, reading process where on the left, if you use our lock and key process, you can truly see the word valid that is meant to be projected. Whereas on the right, if you do not use uh, our lock and key approach, if, if some stranger tries to read it, they're not gonna be able to read truly what we're trying to generate with the tag. So um, we've, got, we've got good counterfeit proof approach here. Um, so that, that entire um, uh, technology is being funded through the National Science Foundation. Changing gears a little bit, one of those areas that we're focused on uh, changing gears a good bit, actually, is uh, high temperature materials for space and hypersonic applications. You know, you really got to employ high temperature, high melting point materials that have mechanical stability and uh, unique properties. And, and in some cases, you want the optical properties to be retained for these high temperature materials. So right in the center there, we had a collaboration with Penn State um, Applied Physics, uh, Applied Research Lab, excuse me. That's a picture of a field assisted sintering technology technique where we partnered with them uh, to, uh, and that basically employs pressure, temperature, and high, highly pulsed current to convert powders into solids with unique shapes. So that's what we, what we did to employ uh, for this one particular phase one with NASA where uh, we were tasked with trying to join two dimensional carbon composites with three-dimensional carbon composites. For those of you out there that are not familiar, carbon composites uh, have uh, great strength, but are much, they're, they're lightweight in comparison to metals. And uh, two-dimensional have different, uh, carbon composites have different uh, characteristics in comparison to say to three-dimensional. And uh, sometimes it's difficult to join these two disparate composite materials. So we employed a unique material called max phase, a, 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 a metal carbide, a ceramic type of material to, to join these two disparate materials using this fast mint technique at uh, Penn State. Uh, moving right along here, um, in a collaboration with Drexel University where Maxines were discovered, uh, we have, we have uh, just concluded an Air Force phase one STTR with Drexel and Maxines are a, a new, relatively newly uh, discovered family of materials of metal carbides with really unique uh, properties. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the audience I'm sure has heard of graphene. Uh, the, the, one of the discoverers, Yuri Vygotsky at Drexel, he likes to refer to maxines as graphenes, uh, graphene on steroids. Uh, so uh, they're pre the precursors to maxines are max phases, these multi-layered structures depicted on the left. 
And what you have to do is you have to uh, etch away interstitial, interstitial uh, metals such as aluminum in order to form these two-dimensional Maxine structures, which are on the right. And Maxines are being explored for a range of unique applications from, uh, from charge storage that are, that's pertinent to batteries to uh, unique optical properties uh, that can be employed to shield uh, a variety of wavelengths of light. Uh, they can be employed to, to uh, filter water and, and decontaminate. They've got unique photocatalytic capabilities, which we've explored at Ballydale as well. So it's really a unique and fun class of materials. And uh, the literature production has just exploded in this area of research in the last 10 years, just, just gone up ex exponentially. So, uh, you know, many, are, many of our folks around the world really understand the great potential of this material. And so as part of uh, our little end of the world at Valley Dell, what our goal was to merely incorporate one of the Maxines into a coating, into a binder system that could be easily painted or sprayed. You know, the, we wanted to match the chemistry of the Maxines with the chemistry of, of a paint, so to speak, or a polyurethane in this case. So we, that was our goal in this phase one. Uh, STTR, and we, we hope to continue this in a phase two with the Air Force. Uh, but long story short, we were well able to integrate um, the, the, this particular Maxine into a sprayable coating. And here's just an example of some panels that were spray coated uh, with the Maxine coatings themselves. On the left is an uncoated uh, panel. And as you go from left to right, uh, the the uh, second most from the left is a Maxine coated, purely Maxine pristine coated uh, panel. And as you go on to the right, uh, a Maxine polyurethane based coating. And this is gonna be scalable for us. So we're, we're pretty excited about the results. And uh, within a very short period of time, we've come up with a nice paint and coating. Um, we also explored integrating Maxines into so-called space coatings, thermal control coatings. Uh, you know, when you're out in space, outside of our atmosphere, when you're in, in, in the presence of the sun, you know, a, a space vehicle can heat up really to high temperatures uh, in the presence of the sun, right? So though you want to have the ability to both scatter that light away, often with a, a white type of pigment coating, but you also want to have the ability to release heat from the internal uh, um direction from, from the vehicle itself, because that vehicle can heat up, which is detrimental to all the instrumentation on the inside of the, uh, the vehicle. So coatings have to be able to scatter visible light, but you also want that coating to emit the heat that's being generated by the, the space vehicle itself. So in this particular uh, scenario, we ex also explored integrating this Maxine material into a commercially available thermal control coating. Um, Again, I told you about uh, Ballydell's endeavor to really integrate and explore novel nanoparticles. Uh, those colorful particles there in the center are quantum dots that you've seen in TVs. Now we, we can make those on the upper right hand. Those little triangles are actually silver triangles. So we have great control over the morphology and shape and size of a variety of nanoparticles. These were uh, silver nanoparticles were grown on titanium dioxide fibers which have both photocatalytic uh, capabilities and potentially uh, one type of solar cell application. But we're exploring all of these different types of structures uh, at the nanoscale and trying to integrate those into a variety of applications. Uh, one of which is a multi-layered structure depicted here in the center. Uh, this is a Chem Bio Defense SBIR. Um, and the goal of this is to make a cheaper pixel for millimeter wave um, cameras, sensors. You know, we go through the airport and we, we get interrogated, right? When we go through uh, customs or not through customs, but through security. Uh, uh, and those, those cameras are very, very expensive, right? So the goal of this is to, to come up with a way that is cheaper in order to make these pixels. And so specifically they requested that we develop or integrate something called a pyroelectric material that can generate a voltage or a response to a very tiny change of temperature. 
And so I'm not going to get into the, all the nitty gritty of this, but the top layer, that pattern checkerboard type of layer is going to absorb very efficiently millimeter wave light that, that the sensor, the, the chip is going to see from the environment. And of course, when you absorb light, what does that happen? You heat up. And so this top layer, this checkerboard layer is absorbing the heat. We're going to transfer that heat into the underlying gray layer, which is, the, which is this pyroelectric material, where we can generate a voltage response. And so, uh, again, the goal here is just to make a cheaper pixel. Uh, you know, I'm kind of letting the cat out of the bag, but we already uh, submitted these proposals. Uh, but I just want to give you a flavor of, boy, we're all over the place in terms of, you know, integrating nanotechnology and our, you know, our knowledge and optics to try to solve problems for the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, et cetera. And so in this case, um, there's a rocket, there's a material that the U.S. Department of Defense uses called RP, red phosphorus. And when you light this red phosphorus up and burn it, so to speak, it creates a very nice cloud of smoke, which can obscure um, the enemy's visibility. You know, this is not classified or anything by any stretch. The problem with RP is that in storage, if there's any moisture present, RP generates something called PH3, phosphine gas, very highly toxic, which is a problem. So this particular solicitation, uh, they asked uh, the small businesses to try to propose a way in which we could interrogate the inside of a storage container for phosphine gas and then and just pro provide a, a level of detection on the outside. So we've uh, proposed to really use, a, I think, a novel approach of employing an optical fiber uh, where we functionalize the optical fiber to be specific to phosphine gas. There's minimal um, invasion into the, into the uh, storage container itself. And we can actually detect with a, sent, a simple readout the, uh, the, the level of concentration of this deadly gas on the outside of the container. So just one little example of another technology we, we're, we're looking to, to grow and explore. And then another one, another final example is going back to space again. You know, uh, there's scenarios where you're in the sunlight, you want to allow that heat to be released. Uh, from the spacecraft as depicted here on the right. Things get really hot. You want the coating, so to speak, on a spacecraft to release the heat. But then when you're on the dark side of the Earth, when you're revolving around uh, the Earth, you get on the, on the dark side of the Earth, things get extremely cold, right? So you want the heat to be retained within the spacecraft in that scenario. So what we're pitching is a very novel uh, nanoparticle-based um, coating that is smart and passive where, hey, in the presence of the sunlight, in the presence of heat, it allows, the coating will allow the heat to be released. But if you get very cold and you're in the dark, uh, that coating passively and smartly uh, flips its properties and now the heat is retained within that coating, within the space vehicle itself. So these are some of our approaches uh, that we're exploring, um, but, Again, it all involves nanotechnology. Don't let anybody know that nanotechnology is, is not being explored in, in product development. Uh, it's just being employed and thought about constantly by large, medium, and small companies like ours. So that's me. You don't need to see me anymore, my background, but uh, uh, happy to uh, give this chat. Thanks for listening, and I'll give it back to Lisa. Thank you so much. And um, we'll go back to, to panel view here. Um, so now you've heard from an entrepreneur who's uh, exploring a number of applications of, of nanomaterials, uh, a user facility, and, um, uh, and, and Tony with Ben Franklin with the, the uh, wide range, the circle of Ben effects. Um, which I thought was a, a very nice way to put it, Tony. I'm going to ask the first question for, for the panel. Um, so we've had these three perspectives today, and, and we've talked about uh, the, the role that you play in, in the ecosystems where you reside, but I'm sure this is, is only the beginning of the pieces that are required 
uh, to have a, a vibrant and successful innovation ecosystem. So I'm going to start with Tony and, and ask, so from your perspective, what are the other pieces that you need that, that you um, engage with that, that help you be successful from your perspective? And um, I'll start with Tony. Great. Thank you. And actually, um, Lisa, thanks you for the, for the heads up on the question because it allowed me to pull another slide from another presentation that I've done. And I'm going to share my screen again to show you what sort of one of the ways that we think about this. And part of it is just asking critical questions. So let's see, can you see that? Is that shared properly? Yes. So all of these things have to happen. Does somebody want it? Does somebody want your product? Can I make it? Can I make it at scale? Can I protect it? IP is, you know, is getting harder and harder to protect. Is somebody willing to pay for it? And this is particularly true, obviously, in life sciences, where you get payment through insurance companies and so forth. Can I raise enough money to succeed? And one of the challenges with any emerging technology and even more advanced and mature technologies, there's never enough funding out there. And it's just a fact of life. But as I mentioned before, do I have the right team? Do I have the right board? Do I have the right advisors to make this a success? And what you need is you need the resources and access to those resources in order to make this happen. And whether that's being done piecemeal, you go to an accelerator or you go work with um, boot camps or you go out to Y Combinator or any of these you know, types of organizations, that's all great. But my, my point in all of this is you need all of this. There's a lot of great technologies out there that are never going to see the light of day. And some of that is because, quite frankly, the technologies just don't work. And some of it's because the, 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 the team just isn't capable of getting the money that they need, or they get to a point where they just don't know how to get a product or how to manufacture it. One of the challenges, if you think about all the things that went wrong during COVID, a lot of it was on the non-sexy stuff. It was supply chain. It was distribution. J&J, Moderna, they made their vaccines. But getting materials, getting supplies, getting chips, and we're still dealing with that right now with the car companies. These are, people don't think about this. But if you don't have all that lined up, we have one company and we remain nameless um, that had an important part that was being manufactured in Europe and got caught in that monstrous ship that got caught in the Suez Canal. They couldn't make their product. So how do you handle that? How do you handle, what, what's your plan B? You know, these are all the, th and so if you think about all the things that went wrong during COVID, you now have to anticipate that. And all of that, unfortunately, costs money and resources. But ultimately, you've got to wrap all this around that it isn't just the technology that's there. And you have to provide those resources. So I, I think that that's a great framing that you provided. And, you know, I think that um, many of us have the, the early R&D um, mindset. And, you know, you talk about training students and, and um, workforce issues, which I'm going to turn to Gerald about a little bit. Um, but but then you know we talk about you know um, you know innovation or, or materials push versus a pull for a need. But I think your point uh, very uh, um, concisely in your questions is you make something, somebody has to buy it, and and whether that's to the mm -hmm. consumer or B and B, um, that's that's part of part of the ecosystem. Um, that's required to, mm -hmm. to support uh, the development of innovation. Yeah. Um, well, let me... Lisa, let me just jump in and Go just one, one additional comment on that. If you want to think about one of the major successes of the I-Corps program, of NSF I-Corps, it's forcing those teams 
to make phone calls to say, hey, I'm, uh, this is what I'm, my product is. Do you want it? And it's amazing how eye-opening that is and how many times we have, I love my faculty in this region. I love them dearly. But when I have to tell them, I'm sorry, this is not a company. Maybe it's a license, but it's not going to, you know, and they get a little persnickety about that. But the fact remains is that if you think about what i is forcing these teams to do, that's at the beginning of the process. Does somebody want this thing? And that's a challenge that, that inverts the normal process of R&D at a research institution. So, so Gerald, let me turn to you and maybe maybe ask the, the same question. So um, when you look at the, the ecosystem that you're a part of that uh, supports uh, nanotechnology commercialization or, or innovation broadly in, in, in Philadelphia, in your region, you know, what are, what are the, the other connections you have or what are the other pieces that, that maybe aren't, aren't well represented today? Um, you know, I, I think I think broader resources in general uh, that the other institutions have excess capacity for isn't really being represented or shown, right? Um, you know, I, I would even say um, just looking internally, right? Um, there's not much coordination between these multiple cores that exist at Penn, uh, and that's that's for that's for certain reasons of being decentralized as a university, right? Um, but I think there's some, if there is some level of coordination um, that will allow, you know, especially within Philadelphia itself, to openly showcase and talk about these available resources like electron microscopes, right? Uh, there's, yeah, I could say there are a dime a dozen, um, but there are very unique pieces of instrumentation that people can use. Um, I, I think that needs to be talked about. Um, and, and, and I think what the other side of that is, you know, university and institutional leadership needs to be aware of that, yes, there could be some threat to damaging the equipment, allowing external users coming in. But, um, you know, if you have excess capacity and you're not recharging your facilities the way you want to, you know, this is a great alternative means. Um, and I, this, this actually, you know, again, goes back to how we have coordinated with among ourselves in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, with the other 16 institutions that are here, uh, with the other managers and operations staff to make sure that, hey, you know, if, if your ion mill goes down, do we have another one that we can have uh, in case um, somebody needs mission continuity from one site to the next? We call that FAD by FedEx, right? You can ship this material over. Um, we need to establish that. We need to have, we need to, you know, we need to make sure that people are aware of that. Um, so so I'm going to come back to that in a minute because you you hit on something that I I want to I want to pursue further. But but before I do that, let me ask um, Brendan to answer the same question. So from the entrepreneur perspective, you know what are the other resources or or um, you know um, mentors or or um, you know what what are other pieces of of your ecosystem that are that are critical to your success? Yeah. I like to talk about this one because, um, okay, number one, what Tony was was speaking to uh, regarding i training for the, the audience that they're not familiar with it, a variety of these funding agencies provide avenues, a, a small amount of funding to dedicate towards uh, surveying the market and trying to understand, does your technology address a need within the market? You, you know, you're not going to sell anything unless... Your, your technology or product is truly solving a problem. And so, so many folks, there's a lot of smart cats around out there, right? They've got all these cool technologies, but is it really a product that addresses the market need? So the only way you're gonna figure that out is by interviewing 50 to 100 companies or people within that um, supply chain that have an understanding of the true market need. And what happened often from that process is the following. You think your technology is right, but from those interviews, you sort of tweak your technology, you, you pivot, and you modify your technology, technology development process to address the specific need, and that's happened to us. That's number one. 
you, you've got to find out the market need first bef before you start developing even. Uh, number two, I would really uh, suggest and emphasize some of these accelerator programs. As a young entrepreneur, like I don't know what I don't know. So I went through a Science Inc. entrepreneurial program based in Delaware. And you have a, a, a plethora of, of uh, mentors who have grown small businesses, flipped companies, folks teaching at Wharton. You know, uh, I was exposed to great mentors uh, during that program. And that has led into really choosing uh, a board of advisors that is appropriate for my technology. And now I have a, you know, a team of folks that I feel good about. And that really, uh, that can help lead the way and, and, and bring me along this process. And that I only gained that, um, that team, so to speak, through my experience uh, with the Accelerator program. Over. Great. So thank you. Um, I, wanna, I wanna go back to something uh, that Gerald said, and, and that was, I, I mean, I think you were talking about it, in, you know, locally, but I want to I want to maybe broaden it. You you mentioned the the need for some level of coordination and uh, raising awareness to the availability of resources. And and I um, my question, my follow up. And, and again, I'd, I'd love everyone's perspective on this is is to take that, you know, you know, twist that a little bit and say, what do we need to do better, right? So, so as the NNCO and the NNI, you know, in you look at the, the strategic plan, you know, we want to raise awareness of, you know, resources such as yours or, or the i program or, you know, the other, uh, the SBIR program that, that Brendan's um, taken advantage of. So, so this, this webinar is exactly for that reason, to, to help share information for um, entrepreneurs and, and, and regional ecosystems that, that might be able to, to strengthen their areas. So, so what can we do? You know, what, what are, what are, do you have suggestions on um, how we can make these connections and, and, and raise awareness of these resources uh, in, in not just in Philadelphia, but across the nation? Yeah, I mean, this is this is a this is a very tough question, right? Um, because it's it's not like someone can pick up a magazine and say, "I'm going to find exactly what I need," right? In this daily periodical of you know uh, whatever it is that they're going to do that day. Um, you know, I, I've noticed, especially for you, Lisa, you uh, have this nonstop content creation that's going on on your side to really put the, the word out that we are all here. Um, and I think that still needs to be continued, right? Uh, funding needs to continue and to keep doors like ours open, right? And, and, and other centers like us uh, across the nation with the NNCI. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're, do, we're all doing our part to kind of make sure that the word is out there. Um, so, you know, if, if there was a way to open more doors, like I was mentioning, you know, if not locally or regionally um, to make you know, this broader awareness that there is, there's, other, there's other resources that are there that are available. I think a lot of people think that if I need to work with the university, I actually need to go and find faculty to work with, or I need to work through a student, or, and it, it really doesn't have to be that way, right? Uh, you know, especially look at what we're doing with the clean room and, and metrology. Um, you know, people think you have to be part of this traditional engineering background to kind of go into the science, where in fact, you know, like, you, like I just uh, demonstrated, have six other schools that are, that are coming in here, with multiple departments each, uh, with these non-traditional backgrounds we're able to teach. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's. It, I, I think on your side, what could you do is keep 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 the funding coming, right? Keep these programs going, um, because you know we're. I, I forget what generation we are in terms of the NNCI. Before that, I was a grad student. I was part of the NNIN, right? Um, and I think, you know, these programs are helping uh, and we're, we're reporting, right, our output and our impact, our, especially our economic impact of what we're producing with these, with these companies that interact with us. So. so, Tony, let me go to you next. Um, you know, are there, are there ways from, you know, the, on, the, on the government side and in our role as a coordination office 
that that we can help uh, strengthen or, or or raise awareness of uh, resources. Um, do you have any any suggestions for us? Sure. I think one of the things that that and this sort of ties into something that, that Gerald was saying. There is a new attitude that I'm certainly seeing at the federal level that coordinating broadly has value and they're and they're matching it with funding and there's two programs that are specific in the last year that have never really been done before in a big way that sort of coalesces a lot of this first was EDA's build back better mm -hmm. and we're everybody's still waiting to hear about the first round of of uh um uh, awards with that. And the second one, which is the newest one, which everybody's jumping up and down about, is the NSF's regional innovation engines. What's important about this, and this is why I, I think this is an interesting uh, discussion, the regional innovations you know, uh, program coming out of TIP, which is a new directorate at NSF, it's the first time in my now, I'm now 16 years at Ben Franklin, where they've actually used the word venture capital in a BAA. They've used the word CEO in a structure, but they are requiring all those, those, those seven elements that I showed in that pie, and they're feeding it. But it also, and this is where the advocacy and the important work that's being done through NNI becomes a part of that dialogue is the recognition by both organizations in this case, that these are long-term initiatives. The Regional Innovations Engine Program, the CARAT is not, is yeah, the million dollars is a million dollars for this type one. The CARAT's the 10 year 160 million. That's a very different mindset. It's not an ERC, it's not a PFI. It's a very different mindset that really focus on what they call translation to practice. And anything that the nano community and the NNI can do to help inform that, to make it valuable, to show that in order to make a regional ecosystem more valuable and more effective, you need access to these critical resources. But for commercial applications. And, and again, underneath this is a technologically competent workforce. Being able to run you know, a nano fab lab is not for the squeamish, you know, and, and to use all those, the very sophisticated equipment. You know, Brendan, you talk about the Maxine. I know Yuri, you know, we funded Yuri very for a long time, Gagazzi at Drexel. I have no clue how he makes this stuff because I'm a biologist stuff eludes me, but the fact remains is that he knows just like you know, you can't scale this up, you don't have a product. And that was one of the challenges with graphene back at the beginning. Just as an example, we had a product, we had a project with a large company that said, we wanna put graphene into water purification technology. And the scale that they needed was a 80 year supply of the available graphene just for one plant. So now, 10 years later, we're in a diff very different place, but you need all of those elements. And this is where the importance of the NNI underneath this, not just on the technology side, but on the policy side and on the push to say, we gotta get this out here. This can help make these things happen. And that's, that's where, in this case, the, the, the goals of the NNI, as I read the updated strategic plan, are much more in line with reality right now because there is real merit to what's being done. But you've got to surround it. Great. So that's super helpful. Um, Brendan, let me ask you, from, from your perspective, I mean, you're obviously, you know, coming from the Army Lab and um, in, in big company and, and being very familiar with 
um, the SBIR process, you know, from from your perspective, you know, is there a federal role to support the the ecosystem um, that 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 perhaps we could we could do better from an entrepreneur perspective? Yeah, for me, it's policy push, like you know, advocating for uh, you know nanotechnology and and associated ecosystem to Congress, you know, uh, and implementing those policies that continue to fund and or grow, you know, this space to provide an avenue for scale up of this or scale up of that. This takes funding, right? And so th the material can positively impact society, but funding is needed always, right? And so, of course, you can go to the venture capital route, but uh, from the government perspective, if an organization like yours can continue to communicate to the folks who make policy and to uh, allow them to, uh, them to understand the importance of continuing to fund this ecosystem that creates jobs and improves people's lives, that, that, that communication is all I would stress. Great, and, and for those of you who haven't seen it, another document is our annual report to Congress. Um, and this is uh, last year's, the, the supplement to the president's uh, 2022 uh, budget. So this is a, a document that we prepare for Congress every year. Um, it provides highlights of uh, uh, progress toward the five goals that are in the strategic plan. It also um, provides uh, information about uh, agencies' plans and priorities for the coming year. And of course, it has all the budget information. So certainly encourage folks to check that out. Um, we're actively working on the next one now. Um, so I'm gonna um, maybe ask one more question and, and close out the webinar for today. Um, I'm gonna ask, um, each of you, I'll, 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 I'll talk a little bit so you pr can prepare your thoughts since I'm not using the script that we developed at all. Um, I have, I have a, a two-part question. So, so first of all, you know, one of the things that we like to do is um, to share advice for, for students or entrepreneurs or, or people who come after you. So, so lessons learned. If, if you were giving yourself advice, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, what, what, what advice would that be? And, and the second half of that is any closing thoughts that we didn't hit that you think are important for this webinar topic. So I'm gonna ask each of you to give advice and then give you the opportunity for any, any last words. And I think I'm gonna go backwards this time. So Brendan, why don't you go first? All right, um, ha -ha. Uh, advice. Let me see here. From a legit, <laughs> if you're going to go the SBI route, SBI route, excuse me, from a logistical point of view, bookkeeping, I'm a chemist, you know, I'm a material scientist. You're going to need other skill sets to get through the process. All right. And some of these organizations can point you in the right direction, but I can't stress the importance of keeping your books properly because it's not a matter of if you're gonna get audited by these government agencies, it's when, and you better have your books in order like they want them. That's, that's one little small logistical thing. Um, a major thought is, uh, I go back to the i -Corps. If there's any folks in a graduate program or undergraduate, or if anybody has a great idea about a technology, reach out to your local small business development center, inquire about this i -Corps program. And before you expend all of this energy and money, et cetera, et cetera, you wanna survey the market. And you can get a few couple bucks to provide labor dollars associated with surveying the market. And I would highly, highly suggest you do that before you expend a lot more energy. Great, thank you. And, and Gerald? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, say, yeah, I really appreciate the talk of product market fit, right? And customer discovery here, because that is something that I've come across a few times with some burgeoning entrepreneurs here that 
really is just, you know, again, their mind's blown away when you start asking these questions, right? If you're trying to, if you're trying to make a billion dollars, is your problem $10 billion, right? You know, it, these, these are the questions that, you know, drive the impetus into actually what are you doing and why? Um, and so we need to actually keep asking those questions. Um, you know, if, 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 you're a, if you're an institution or a university planning into, you know, to open up your resources and opening up your, your, your doors to external folks, my, my, my first suggestion is that you really need to find someone that can, that, that can straddle that fence and talk to both worlds. Uh, you really need someone that, that knows how to coordinate those agreements, understand compliance, right? Um, build programs that, you know, we can actually foster engagement um, and talk the science, right? Um, and unfortunately, there's not many people that are able to do that or want to do that. Uh, but also, unfortunately, there's not much leadership that realizes they need that. Um, and I think, you know, you know, if I were to ask the federal government if we could have, have help somewhere, it's making um, these other institutions realize that this is a critical piece to bridge that gap. Um, because, you know, positions and roles like mine are very far and few between, right? Um, and I think that's absolutely essential. Um, and what was the second question, Lisa? I forgot. Um, so there was, a, there was advice and any last, you know, any closing yeah. thoughts? So closing thoughts is obviously, uh, I, I think it, I, it talks more about professional development and where are we going, right? We have the CHIPS Act on the horizon. Um, and and I, I, I really would love to see more discussion about, you know, if you're gonna foster with what 50 some billion dollars, uh, uh, this, this demand, employment demand, you know, ask, ask the question, again, this is product market fit for the $50 billion. What problem are you trying to solve? Is there a gap that we need to close for the institutions to feed into this workforce? If that's the case, how much does that cost? How much more faculty do we need to hire? And is that funding gonna come from the CHIPS Act to do that, right? And I think that's something that, you know, if we're going to create these new fabs and create these new places, do we have the proper bandwidth to, to achieve that with our labor market? And I think that's a very critical piece. So that's, a, so that's an entirely different discussion, but I will say that is, that is a, a question under active discussion and I'll, I'll leave it at right. there and glad to follow up with you later. Um, Tony. Yeah, uh, two comments. First, you know, the question about what can, what can the NNI, what can we do as scientists and so forth? And one of the issues that has not been brought up here, but needs to be to some degree front and center and all of this is education and building an educate, not just an educated workforce, an educated population. And going all the way back, I remember the nano cartoons that, they, that were being published you know, years ago, many people are still you know, a little bit skittish about new technology. There's still a lot of Luddites out there. And the better job we can do to educate at the earliest levels is going to have huge implications as these people get older and the understanding about science. I think that's a critical piece that gets is missing in a lot of these discussions. But in the end, certainly, you know, in my experience, what I, I think needs to change is this two things. I call it this culture of impatience. And the fact that people expect things to be done in two days or two weeks or two years. This is hard. Entrepreneurship is hard, it's lonely, and it's always about failure. And that's something that most people don't quite understand. And so if you, you know, thinking about it in, in, a, in, in, a, in a writ large scenario about how the, the use of nano, look how long we've been talking about this. But it takes time. Every new technology, roughly, the studies are out there, 20 years. I started working in monoclonal antibodies 40 years ago. It's, you know, now it's routine. CRISPR, there's a big article in the Times today, is now 10 years old. It's just now starting to be used you know, out there and getting, and getting into, into, into clinical trials. This stuff takes time. 
and we have to be able to educate population as well as the funding agencies and Congress that these issues aren't going to be solved in two years with the next election cycle. These things take a long time. That's a very tough nut to crack. But it's I, I consider that part of my obligation to get that message out there that it's important that these things will take time and you're going to fail most of the time. May not be the brightest message, but it's the reality that's out there. So, so how do I how do I spin this into a, a, a high note on the on the way out of the webinar today? Thank you all mm -hmm. very much for your time and your thoughts and, and your perspectives. I think um, it's it's been a great discussion this afternoon to to look at you know the different pieces of the ecosystem and in in how to get involved. And I would just um, encourage the listeners to, to keep an eye on nano.gov for, for more information, um, more webinars like this, and um, activity uh, opportunities, activities and opportunities to engage um, through, through all sorts of uh, outreach and other activities. Um, and with that, thanks, thanks again to our panelists and for your, for your time and your insight. And I wish everybody a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa.